This is the I've never I haven't personally my... sat in this yet. It's not terrible. It's not that comfortable. It's not... This is a bad idea. <laughs> I just choked on my coffee. <laughs> Dude, I do, I'm- I'm not good at this. I'm so OCD about it, like. Hey everybody, Resident Loser Jeremy here. Welcome to the Tiny Sofa Interviews, where we talk about big topics on small furniture. Got Matt McQueen here from Capsule to Cone. Go check out his channel, I'll put a link in the description. He was popping by, driving through, picking up some gear at some other places, and we thought it was a good chance to hook up and just chat. But Matt is an audio professional, making a living with a career, doing a few different things. A couple different things, yeah. Glad to be here though, yeah. On my little my little journey through Ohio and Indiana, picking up some stuff. A lot of snow, a lot of corn. A lot of snow. We don't have this much snow in Tennessee. So my first question isn't necessarily a question. Okay. I grew up in Frankfurt, Indiana, not too far from here. I was a hot dog. I went to high school there. You own Gem City Studios, is that correct? Yeah. Frankfurt is known as Gem City. Matt McQueen, why are you following me? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> this purely incidental, but I was when I started my studio, I uh, I just wanted a name that was kind of endearing to the town. And uh, Jellico, Tennessee, which is where I am, was in the mountains. And it's a super tiny little town. But right when you get off of the interstate onto the, you come to the bottom of the exit ramp, there's a gas station and a huge sign that says, Welcome to Jellico, the gem city of the mountains. That's why. So it's called the gem city too. Yeah. But it was something that would be like, you know, the people in the town would find endearing and uh, they would know that um, I wasn't there just trying to make rock and country records in their backyard because I'm not from there I didn't grow up in Jellico yeah so when my wife and I moved here we were here for about three years before I opened the studio and before I started renting the building which I eventually bought and I just wanted something that the local folk would be like okay here's this guy that's you know a little bit of an outsider but he's trying to also be part of the community that's kind of how I always have seen it and while I was growing up there I was like why do they call it the gym city there's not that many gyms here like GYM. I have people all the time because it's a studio, like when I'm trying to, I'm buying something over the phone or giving people my email address, which is gem, you know, at gemcitystudios.com, they immediately hear Jam City, which I'm like, that's kind of, that's, that's cheesier, but it's also kind of better. <laughs> Jam <laughs> City Studios, but yeah, anyways. What's your earliest musical memory? Uh, my earliest musical memory is being probably three years old and my dad had a bunch of 45s, singles, small records, and um, he had, uh, which this is funny because of the meme now because of Family Guy, but uh, he had Surfing Bird by the Trash Men. And <laughs> I thought that song was so awesome when I was three years old because of all this, the sound effects that guy does with his voice and, and uh, you know, just the way that he sings that song. And, and uh, man, I played, I played that song to death, getting my dad's record player out at three, four years old and putting the Trash Men Surfing Birds on there. So that's probably my earliest musical memory. That's wild. Yeah. Nobody's ever asked me that question. That's cool. I like that one. How did you get your start in music that eventually led you to where you are now? So I was uh, in college in a band and we had gone to, we had done two EPs and our second EP was at our guitar player's brother's house, um, John King, my friend John. John, if you're watching. Uh, and uh, John was very much at that time starting out um, in recording. He had just built his studio. He had just come from the Phoenix Conservatory. And so he was showing me some stuff and I was very interested in it because I was already a bit of a computer nerd. And so the whole idea of Pro Tools and you're recording in the computer and it, it, it definitely led me down the rabbit trail of like wanting to. So my senior year of college, after we left the studio, I built a computer. I got a Cubase SX3 was the, the software yeah. that I got, was learning on that and just pretty much spent my entire senior year of college not going to class and sitting in my dorm room writing songs and, and trying to figure out recording. How old were you when, when that started? 20. How old are you now? 39. 39. We're a couple of old guys. We are a couple of old guys. Yeah. Stuff's yeah. starting to hurt. Getting out of bed is, is sort of like crawling out from a, you know, a car wreck. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I almost texted you twice this morning like, dude, I might be like an hour and a half late. I might sleep longer. But I <laughs> This is a tiny sofa. It is. So you make your living in the music industry. Yeah. How many different revenue streams or how diversified are you? How important do you think that is well especially when you're um trying to be a professional you want to be full-time and you're not 
you know, credits are still really important in this business to being able to get bigger, bigger, more important gigs, higher paying gigs. There's a bit of a, a misnomer that you're not a professional if you're not like super well credited. Yeah. You know, there is some truth to that. There's definitely some imposters and some charlatans out there that are not credited and pretend like they're, they're pros and they're not. Um, but there's also pro guys like this that are, you know, working professionals that are recording with independent artists day in and day out. And I think that, uh, I think that this is not the answer to your question. <laughs> No, this is fine. Keep <laughs> going down this okay. road. I like this okay. better. Okay, I'm glad you like it better. So I think that there's that whole thing. Um, and, I, and uh, you know, because of that, um, work comes in. Sometimes I feel like I'm, like, way busy with all the independent artists. But then I, you know, I, it's... It definitely waxes and wanes and there's there are seasons where I've had two months where I only have like a few mix gigs and so because of that now that uh, the studio is a little bit busier and that I've purchased the building and you know have a few irons in the fire as far as that goes it's you know really important to have a couple of other things that uh, that are like um, pads I guess so one of the things that I do is I I started before I was actually rec a recording engineer um, or when I was just building the studio and starting out I actually started out in live sound um, by, by doing fill-in mm -hmm. gigs for like festivals um, or uh, there was a, a venue in Knoxville Tennessee called the square room where I got to work with a bunch of cool bands sometimes what I would do is I would just take my laptop and and do pro tools you know for whatever the live show was and not tell anybody and I never did anything with it but I bring it back and I would just practice mixing whatever the live recording was so and that led to uh, trying to find other gigs and I ended up going and um, the church that I now work for part-time I kind of was like well I've been doing live sound for a while maybe it'd be cool I actually thought that it would be cool a cool way to meet some other musicians because it's such a large church it's like 2,500 people so I thought well I'll do I'll volunteer like once a month and run sound and then that'll give me the end to meet all the cool guitar players and drummers and stuff like that and I'll find out what bands they're in and and, and maybe you know so I was totally going to church as a way to create a revenue stream <laughs> Which sounds terrible, but uh, it ended up that the first Sunday that I ran sound, I thought the mix was terrible. I was like, this is a joke. Like, they're going to call me tomorrow and say, don't ever come back. Executive pastor called me the next day, and I was for sure looking at the phone like, I'm not going to answer this because he's going to be like, thanks, but don't ever volunteer again. <laughs> and uh, I answered it, and he said, hey, we'd like to sign you up for a contract to do sound for the rest of the year every Sunday. Really? And he was like, yeah, man, this sounded great yesterday. Like, and so that sort of started me going like, hmm, so I could pad the income, like, you know, by having a couple of part-time gigs like this. And uh, it wasn't very long after that, that um, Country Bar uh, opened up uh, about 30 minutes away from me in Corbin, Kentucky. They were looking for sound engineers and I went and interviewed for that job purely because I thought, well, I do a lot of country anyways. And so maybe if I'm running sound a couple Fridays a month that I'll be able to talk to bands and get them to come. And sure enough, that's what happened, you know? So, so that, that did materialize into something. Yeah, the church thing never did. I just got the gig. I've never done any uh, worship music or anything like that. Um, uh, they, and the only clients that I had from the church were clients that I had before I ever went there. So mm. I've gotten no new work from that other than the fact that I just do front of house every week, which is so funny to me, actually, because I, f I feel like I was really trying hard to play the angles and I thought it was so smart and it's not turned into anything. <laughs> That's really it. I, I, I kind of see a lot of that similar in what I'm doing. And I think a lot of people would be really surprised at how much anybody in our situation does that's not studio related. Yeah. Especially when you're not one of the like, I don't even know how to put it, like legend is even probably too high of a title to put on some of these sure. people who are really well known for being producers, just straight up engineers. Right. But how many different types of revenue streams we have or how many different things you just want to have your hands in just because of the amount of doors it opens. Well, and even like the few guys that I know that are, you know, pretty well credited, you'd be surprised. Like when you're talking about other revenue streams, like there, I know a couple cats in Nashville that I've met over the years that uh, are are pretty good mixers and they actually have um, their hands in real estate you know like some of those records pay pretty good to mix those records but they also they're they're really sometimes more few and far between than you would think and there's not a lot of local acts that are willing to pay hmm. 800 to a grand per song you know to mix or whatever their rate is to mix a song and and so that was one of the things that was eye-opening to me it was a couple of years ago I had one friend that's a that's a mixer just tell me like yeah I started getting into real estate because I love mixing and I'm not gonna give that up but it's also not you're not ever we're not ever gonna make more money than what we're making right now at it diversify stemming off of that having a family can you talk about 
I guess, how you approach working in an industry like this that is notorious, whether it's true or not, for being all made up of night owls. You have to be open 24 seven. You're at the beck and call of whoever mm -hmm. knocks on the door, or I guess, how do you balance that lifestyle with a family? It's hard. It was easier when my kids were younger and they went to bed early. Um, so a lot of times what I would do is just come home at like five or six o'clock and um, do the family thing for a few hours. And then, uh, you know, my wife was really gracious. I would, I'd, you know, tuck the kids in, leave, go back to the studio at nine o'clock and work until, you know, and especially when I was working for Warren, you know, I mean, I would go to the studio and be there at three in the morning sometimes working on video content that we were making, you know, and so it was, uh, that was a crazy time in my life, it was super busy. Um, and I think that's just the balance is trying to find those, find those gaps when it makes sense. And, you know, there's still like, you know, my, my kids, uh, you know, they get, uh, they get sad, they get tired that sometimes, you know, a lot of the bands that I work with are, you know, working dudes that, you know, want to do like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday thing. I mean, there's a lot of times that, you know, the kids have gone to art museums and, and, and the zoo and I'm crammed up in the studio. So I also try to just make sure that like a couple of times every six, seven weeks that there's a day that I'm like, you know, I tell my wife, hey, go ahead and put this on the calendar and let's just do something family related so that you know, I'll know that that's already on the family calendar and when a band calls to book, I'll, I can just say, I don't, you know, I don't have this weekend available. And so that's important because if I didn't do that, I would literally work every weekend. And it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy to fall into that. What's interesting, my wife works as a store manager, so her schedule is constantly changing. Oh yeah. With my constantly changing. So yeah. it's like I'm building windows to work. Yeah. And if nothing's happening, I just go home. So, and that was really, really hard because for the first few years of having a building and owning a building, like it is, like you say, like if, if my calendar's open, I'm going to work constantly mm -hmm. just because you're the only one writing your own paycheck, essentially. Eventually forced myself to not work. No, you, I mean, I, I think that's a good point there because you also will experience, I'm sure you have, you'll experience these seasons too, where there's like your family needs you or your significant other needs you and needs time from you to make sure that that relationship stays quality. There is work to be done that, you know, like that's at least two days or that's at least three days of e editing and mixing. And I won't get paid until that. And you know that bills are coming in six, eight days, 10 days, whatever. And so there's that whole rub of like, I need to spend this quality time with my loved ones. But I also need to work because it is if I don't finish this, I'm not getting paid for it. So it is a very uh, when you're 100 percent freelance, it is a very delicate balance. And so I think to go to circle back to how you started this whole thing, that's one of the reasons why to me, even though now it's probably the first season of my life where the records that I'm doing are expensive enough that I could self sustain without having a couple of side hustles. My schedule is also not so jam packed that I can't have a couple of side hustles. And so it's nice to keep those. It's nice to keep the church gig. It's nice to fill in at the bar still and do, do those few live sound things every week. It keeps me from having to make my schedule so jam packed full of recording stuff and to be able to still build in some family time without having to worry about if I don't finish this project, Project, I'm not gonna get paid you know the church check covers all of my bills my you know mm -hmm. that, that contract alone covers all of my mortgage and my expenses at the studio that's awesome. so that's that's pretty nice I mean I'm fortunate because I'm in the mountains in East Tennessee so real estate was cheap uh, utilities are, are fairly affordable so I have a pretty unique situation I think that's for anybody you know that's the lesson there is that you know having some diversity can still and before I had those gigs I kept a part-time job in, in IT as I was building the studio. So being in a small town, yeah, because there's a lot of questions that I get from people watching that who assume I'm in Nashville. Oh, I thought Basically. you were in Nashville before we started talking, yeah. <laughs> there's great ways to make careers anywhere just be simply because you don't have the overhead that a lot of those people have. And I think that can be a real benefit too. building up like kind of an emergency fund when you're a freelancer and having like those three months or six months, wherever possible, you can cover your bills if there is no work and being somewhere where your overhead is as minimal as it could possibly be mm -hmm. is definitely a benefit. I mean, yeah. do you see pros and cons to not being at a huge music hub? How do you feel about that? Yeah, the con is definitely, I, I, I will get people that um, are 45 minutes to an hour from my studio and will end up driving four hours to Nashville because they can, you know, I mean, especially in country music, 
there's mm. the whole mythos of like, you know, I'm a Nashville recording artist because I went to a studio in Nashville. Quite frankly, you know, I've got friends in Nashville that are fantastic and that do an awesome job, but they're also like, we're talking about charlatans in the industry. There's a bunch of just straight up demo factories that don't care about what your song sounds like. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, you, this is going on your channel. You're probably going to get hate comments for that <laughs> one thing that I just said just now. So uh, don't do it. Go to my channel and put those mean comments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy doesn't deserve it. But seriously, like that that bothers me, like when people bypass me um just because it's not Nashville, so that's definitely the con of being in a small city. Uh there's always gonna be just just existing in Nashville guarantees you some amount of work. I mean it's just that's just the facts. Uh we know that it's Music City, for, especially on this side of the country. The obvious pro though to working in a small city is that my overhead, like we were talking about, is insanely insanely low and i have a 3000 square foot building the overhead for that place is a, a fourth of what some of my friends in nashville are that have a fourth of the space that i have and are paying four times more you know i've got a friend with a room that he's paying you know almost four grand a month for and it's like 800 1200 square feet maybe i've got 3000 square feet holy cow all of my utilities internet mortgage Fifteen hundred dollars is my nut. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty low. I mean, it's East Tennessee. You know, there's nothing there. You know, if you can deal with that, come to East Tennessee. We will. We'll, we will welcome you. <laughs> yes, good records are made in Nashville. We're. I don't think either of us will argue that fact. But no. just like anywhere else, yeah. where you have a higher concentration of anyone in a certain industry, you will have those like what you're saying, like charlatans. Yeah. But those also exist anywhere. But it's also it's oh, yeah. it's easy to us uh, and. Uh, I have encountered that where bands do want to go down to Nashville. There's kids up here sure. who go down to Nashville to record, and now that's all over their Facebook page that they're a Nashville recording artist. Like, yeah. Well, are you? You just <laughs> you just went down there to record. Whatever. Yeah. Literally anyone can do that, though. And anyone can pay to go to a studio in Nashville. They won't turn you away. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I won't turn people away either, and you can be a Jellico recording artist, so... Yeah, or a Western recording artist. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can... Kokomo, Indiana. Get here fast. Jellico. And we'll take it slow. Try between. Actually, those are t tag teams. Some there, we go. there we go. That'd be sweet, man. That'd be sweet. So, I, I for all the kids watching, that was a Beach Boys reference I threw in. They probably don't know that. So, I didn't even catch. <laughs> oh, you didn't catch it either. <laughs> I was like, surely, being from here, he's gonna catch this <laughs> stupid Beach Boys reference. <laughs> I know we live in Kokomo. Yeah. Come. Okay, now the hard hitting stuff. All right. Favorite pop tart flavor? <sighs> Brown sugar. Is there another one? <laughs> I don't know. My wife keeps buying other ones for my kids, and I'm like, you're doing this wrong. <laughs> so what what part of your personality do you think helps you in a career like this, working with other people, working in music? And what part of your personality do you think can be a detriment? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, so I think I'm pretty pretty social I, I really like hanging out with people uh, I think I really am pretty extroverted most of the time I mean I think we're all a little of both people describe themselves as one way or the other but I think it's it's nice to have people in the studio I really like having people in and being able to hang out and talk and get to know what makes them you know excited about music so that's the part of the job that I think is interesting to me is just learning what other people like about songs and for some reason that connection has always helped me like even if it's a band that I'm like oh, this band sucks, I would never listen to them. And then I listen to somebody else's opinion on it. For some reason, that kind of helps to mold my opinion and look at music or listen to music differently than what I did when I heard it myself. And um, I, so I think that's probably something that's been helpful to me in this job. I think the part of the, the part of my personality that is probably a detriment to this job is that I'm a little bit actually um, too much of a gear nerd, which sounds weird because this job can be very gear centric. I still think that that's probably a thing that's too much, even though I'm finding the older that I get, the less that I care about gear and all the money that I've spent over the past seven, eight years of owning my studio. I don't think that I could count uh, enough instances where this money directly made me make a better record um yeah you know on 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 one hand i don't think i have enough of those to fill up fill up fill up five you know fingers <laughs> worth of of oh this time this time this time i really don't uh the only things that have helped me make better records are learning more about music and learning more about songwriting and hiring better musicians when i need studio studio musicians and and things like that it's never ever been a Man, I bought this sweet preamp, and now my kick drum sounds so good, my records yes. are better. That's never happened. <laughs> nope. It's never happened. Every time I buy a piece of gear or a guitar amp or anything, I'm always like, yeah, it's going to be the, this is going to be the game changer, and it's never the game changer. never is. And you make a good point there. Like One of the things that has made a difference for you was 
hiring better players. Oh gosh, dude, that's huge. It's <laughs> it's, it's so huge. like that's the point. I don't want to yeah. brush over because I've kind of mentioned the same thing yeah. in a few other videos. I learned more the first time I hired a listers to mm -hmm. come in. I mm -hmm. learned more in that eight hour section of time than the four years I'd worked in this building mm -hmm. before, like in one single day. Oh yeah. And it yeah. was it was amazing. Like so if you can hire players before you upgrade your interface, before you upgrade your converters, whatever that is, hire good players. It's it's the thing that opened my eyes to like when I always wondered like how do they really do a session where they're doing like six, eight, ten songs ten songs a day. The most that I've heard somebody talk about was um my friend Smith Curry, who's a session steel player mm -hmm. in Nashville, does all the steel work for me. And he he actually doesn't he doesn't come to the studio. He just flies it to me from his home studio. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. But he does these slam sessions on uh, like about once a month on a Friday, where he'll get six uh, him him included six session guys. They'll rent a studio for a day, get an engineer, and I was like, so how many songs have you done in the slam session? Where they'll just get like demos or work tapes from people. And he's like, ah, he said I think the most we did was sixteen, but man, that was a long day. And I was like, sixteen freaking songs he's like yeah man that was a long one so i think the most we've ever done here was eight eight songs in a day i wouldn't do that again the most i, I did a christmas ep um in one day and that was a long day um we did all the we did all the main band tracks by like six o'clock and then we did all of the all of the overdubs for all the other guitar parts and things like that um by, by like midnight and that was such a long day of like you know from 10 in the morning until midnight but session dudes Awesome. Higher session players. Higher session players. For God's sakes. <laughs> What's something you've learned about yourself that you appreciate in all the years you've been doing this in the music industry? Okay, so this is not a, this is probably not the answer that a lot of people are going to expect, but I think um, what I've learned about myself is that I work better if I take breaks frequently. So when I've got a band in for a long session, and a lot of my sessions are like, they might come in at like three, four in the afternoon, and we work until like two in the morning or whatever. And I used to be very strict of like, you know, trying to just like, would barely take a break to eat, you know, just go get fast food and then come back and just keep keep working. Because I my fear was like, oh, they're going to think that I'm overcharging because I'm wasting time or they're gonna feel like that they didn't get their money's worth because we're not working hard enough and getting enough done and what I started to learn was that man sessions are way more fun if you take breaks and so usually I have I have a couple of like funny YouTube videos that are like my go-to's of like <laughs> a band needs to see this video you know or stuff that's just like interesting like have you guys you know and so it's nice to take a little break in the middle of set you know drums are done getting tracked and we're getting ready to set up for bass but like hey man I need to get a cup of coffee and I want to show you this video you know and then you have that and that usually sparks some sort of a conversation whether it's funny or whether it's like a thing of like something that's really interesting and music related and it can kind of help to spark up those conversations and and get you to figure out what it is that the band likes or what it is that the artist likes you know musically because it's something that's that's interesting even if it's a humorous like music related video so keep a couple of those in your back pocket take a break don't ever worry that you're wasting a bunch of time I mean you know don't like take two hour lunch breaks or something like that but mm -hmm. you know spend a little time you know with the band and and uh, get to know them and, and take a little break every now and again to, to 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 not make everybody feel like it's like this strict and tight schedule because that gets a little uncreative absolutely and there's definitely something to connecting with somebody like that and figuring out them on a human level mm -hmm. that can really help you tap into what they want on a musical level for sure because there's so much personality that goes into it and if you can figure out how to get into somebody's head from yeah. a genuine standpoint do you have any advice for up and comers who want to do what yeah uh, i do have a couple of things first of all it doesn't matter whether you're in uh, what doesn't matter what doll you're in learn your keyboard shortcuts <laughs> yes <laughs> learn your keyboard shortcuts because it drives me crazy to see an up-and-comer mousing around aimlessly <laughs> so learn your keyboard <laughs> shortcuts uh that's thing number one two uh learn how to edit without uh killing the vibe i think a lot of people they just automatically assume that like if you're editing you are killing the vibe totally and that's not true like mm -hmm. uh that and the reason that i know that is because that was my intuition and so my first few years of making records i would only edit the drums and then leave everything else just this crazy loose mess and because I thought, well, at least the drums are tight, but I'm keeping the vibe of the music. And since huh. then, I've started editing. I edit everything um, and try to make sure that it's tight, but the right kind of tight, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
that only comes from practice and learning when to do things and when not to do things and and uh, and listening to other songs and figuring out like okay like you know certain rock songs sound bigger when the downbeat chord flams a little around the beat uh, it makes it sound bigger and wider and, and 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 huger. But then also like something that's country, like if you've got an acoustic guitar and uh, the kick drum and the bass guitar and they all flame a little bit, that sounds terrible. Yeah, <laughs> that yes. sounds real bad. So you know, it's just uh, and the, you only are going to get that from experience. Do you have any predictions for recording gear or software that will be the next big thing to change the industry? Oh gosh, that's cool. Um, I don't know. It's not something I think about often, but I, w I really wish I could make a prediction on that. <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, uh, who would have thought that uh, you know something like the Kemper would come along? Um, so I feel like it'd be something. That's a good point. Uh, something, something like that would uh, would be the obvious answer. But man, I really don't know if I have. I mean, we're already like we're seeing so many of those sort of things. That's fine. Okay, I think that's a great question though. So that's why I feel the rub of like not wanting to pass it up. What do you think about that? What do I think? Yeah, do you have something? I feel like AI is going to play a huge role. Mm. And eventually, like, we can just all be creative in our approach to recording. Interesting. And the rest of it will, of it will just slowly fade away. Because think about the things we don't have to think about anymore, like yeah. tape. We don't have to worry about syncing up ADAP machines. We don't have to worry about yeah. so many things. There are some certain things that being like an engineer, like we have to know certain tricks, but I think eventually yeah. those will go away. And the music makers who just make good music will eventually be the forefront again. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm... Uh... Maybe to a fault in, in, in the opposite in in that sense. Like the the way that I think about stuff is like I'm trying to buy old Marshalls and and Les Pauls and and Strats in a world where we're trying to make stuff that's more poppy and electronic and mm -hmm. on laptops and stuff like that. Because I'm like eventually I'll be the old guy that's like this. There's this one guy that does this thing, <laughs> and we should go to him for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, that's probably maybe that's to a degree unwise but i yeah. love my amps i love my real drum set <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i just think that's coming down the pike no i think you're probably right about that well thanks man for coming thanks yeah. for talking thanks for sitting on the tiny couch where we talk about big issues i'm resident loser jeremy i'm matt mcqueen we'll see you in the next one i'll see you in the next one you won't see probably not go yet. check out his channel the link's in the description <laughs> see you guys thanks man <laughs>